Good day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. Happy Sunday morning. This is a video I'm making for a friend of mine in Western Australia. A fella called VB Ed. Arr. Well, I'm drinking coffee because it's early in the morning. Too early to start drinking alcohol anyway. So, Ed wanted me to tell him about mistletoe because he made a video where he pointed out that mistletoe is a parasitic plant. You know, the mistletoe bird, bird exists just to live on the mistletoe berries. The bird eats the berries and then flies off and finds another tree that the bird thinks needs to have mistletoe growing on it. The bird then sits on the tree and ships the berries out onto the tree and the mistletoe berries germinate, sprout, dig into the bark, dig into the plant, get into what they call the xylem and the phloem cells which is sort of like the arteries and the veins as far as a plant is concerned, carrying nutrients and water up from the roots and processed sugars down from the, the leaves. So your mistletoe plant gets hooked into the tree's circulatory system or fluid transport system, since there's no actual throbbing pump. Um, and then the mistletoe grows and that was about as far as Ed had taken it and he figured therefore being a parasite mistletoe is unreservedly a, a horrible idea to think about and I pointed out to him in the comment thread that uh, there are something like 23 species of mistletoe in Australia and 21 of them are native and there's you know half a dozen species of mistletoe bird that have evolved and lived here for thousands of years specifically on certain kinds of mistletoe like not every mistletoe bird will be able to eat every mistletoe berry um, and he hadn't heard of that so he asked me to make a video about mistletoe so here we go mistletoe have you noticed the mistletoe behind me I had walked quite a distance looking for a mistletoe on one of my trees. I used to have lots of them, but now there's very few of them. There, we have a gum tree, like lots of gum trees are. And if we come up here and get some sunlit telephoto views of the leaves of that gum tree, and then have a look at those leaves, which are growing on the same branch. And you see that concentration, a couple of concentrations, clumps of lumpy black wood with very short, fragile branches coming off and leaves that look a lot like a gum tree, but hanging in a different sort of a branch, much thicker than the way your actual gum leaves hang in a branch on that tree. That, Eddie, is a species of mistletoe. And where is this? Here's a fair example of a eucalyptus tree's dendritic structure, I suppose you could call it, the leaf and stem structure. Admittedly, this one is suffering an infestation, which is some kind of a moth laying eggs on the leaves growing into caterpillars which are chewing the shit out of the leaves if we come across and we have a look at the mistletoe it's a much denser structure which effectively dangles from the branch of the eucalyptus tree so what that means is that in any kind of a wind event, these long dangling thin structures with lots and lots of curved leaves to act as sails, they get thrashed around pretty good and pretty hard. And they break off. And they drop their leaves and their twigs on the ground underneath the tree whose uh, branches they're parasitizing. 
So whereas a tree might live for 200 or 300 years perhaps, if it gets really badly infected by mistletoe, if it had 20 or 30 mistletoes hanging off it, rather than one that's dying up there, and another one here, which is a fairly healthy sort of a mistletoe, it's green and it's growing and it's long and it's extended and it's got you know fresh green shoots on it. Like I said, if that tree had 60 mistletoe infestations on it, it would probably die from the mistletoe. And it would take maybe 20 years to die, perhaps longer. Or, you know, maybe the tree will drop so much nutrients that the tree gets better because it creates an organic layer of topsoil in the decomposing mistletoe, which is living on the nutrients that the tree is bringing up from deep underground that none of the, quote, surface feeders have got access to. So perhaps the mistletoe can heal the tree to the point where the mistletoe dies, and that's what's kind of happened around here. I, nearly every tree used to have mistletoe in it 20 years ago now. You've got to have a look at every tree on an acre or so before you find a mistletoe. Um, so you can think of mistletoe as an accelerated nutrient pump. It'll put a couple of hundred years worth of nutrients on the ground under the tree that the mistletoe bird has decided, hey, shit, you need an infestation of mistletoe because some idiot has cleared and overgrazed the ground around you and you're the only nutrient pump for that whole part of the paddock. And lo and behold, I watched my next door neighbour who'd killed all these trees come up to me in the pub a week or so later. And his story was that um, he'd done all them trees a favour for killing them because they all had mistletoe and they was gonna die anyway. And I suppose that was a conclusion that he'd come to because he'd never ever watched what happens to trees when they get mistletoe and they're not being grazed under by large numbers of hard-footed land lice. He'd never actually seen the gum trees get healthier, use the mistletoe to pump nutrients onto the top layer of the ground so that you could get a new build-up of topsoil and a profusion of shrubs and understory and grasses. He'd never ever thought of mistletoe as being an emergency wound dressing to try and undo the desertification of being in production under sheep for a hundred years on a fragile part of the landscape. And one of the funny things is, as I watched over a couple of years, sure he ran maybe twice as many sheep the year after he killed all the trees because the trees in dying were dropping all their leaves and twigs and they were putting nutrients on the ground and that was growing extra grass and the sheep were eating the extra grass and he was sustaining more sheep. But five years after he killed all the trees in the paddock, he was running half as many sheep as he was running before he killed the trees. So he sort of, he achieved a spike and then he went down into a plateau and a trough and he, he desertified that paddock and he dropped his long term production and carrying capacity by killing the trees because they had mistletoe and he thought mistletoe was bad because it was a parasite. True story. And one of the funny aspects of that particular true story is I noticed this in the middle 1980s and I started talking about it and it wasn't until the late 1990s that the boffins at the New England University School of Biology caught up with the idea and, and realised that hey mistletoe acts as a nutrient pump so you know once again he warbles on a lot through the, the field. And here's another thing about mistletoe. When it flowers, it makes fruit or berries. If you look really carefully, you can see them up there. They're little green blobs. Hard to find one that's in the light with a suitable amount of shade behind it to show on the film. Anyway, when they, uh, when they ripen and mature, those little berries have some sort of sweet and juicy pith couple of millimetres thick under the skin over the seed and uh, that's put there to attract the birds of course but sweet colourful juicy tasty pith on something that dangles down 
and all you got to do is throw a stick or a rock at it and a bit of it will break off and you can get a handful of berries. I think about six species of mistletoe are edible and they're considered food plants and they're a delicacy because eucalyptus trees don't actually make much else that you can directly eat. I mean, you can have bees and steal their honey. You can have lurps, which will produce manna and drop that onto the ground. And you can pick up manna from the ground and eat the white sugary excretions of an insect. But with mistletoe, yeah, it converts a gum tree into something that makes treat food for humans. Back in the early colonial days when nobody had any money, the Aboriginal children taught the new settlers' children how to eat mistletoe berries. It was what they had instead of candies and confectionery. So there you go, Ed. There's a fair bit that you have to get to know before you know what you're talking about on the subject of mistletoe. And I only know a little bit, and that's more or less the limits of it. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. I found another tree with a pair of mistletoe. This time, it's a young box tree. Probably only about 25 years or so old. I say that because it's a single growth tree and I'm pretty sure a bulldozer was operating here 26 years ago. So the tree has grown and it's acquired two mistletoe clumps. So that's the foliage on the box tree. That's the first mistletoe and then the second mistletoe and it dangles down there. Most of the other trees in the canopy have no mistletoe. And this is the ground the mistletoe is fertilizing. Wax lily, mukran, carpet beard heath, different beard heath, all being fertilized by the mistletoe that's using that young box tree as an accelerated nutrient pump, which I think is pretty cool. Especially if it's a kind of mistletoe that makes berries that people like me can eat, perhaps. And in conclusion, if in doubt, read the instructions. In this case, crack a textbook. Mistletoes. These parasitic, parasitic shrubs drape from the branches of shrubs and trees. Australia has more than 80 species in two families and they vary greatly in appearance. Leaves can be broad, slender or absent. The fruits are round, oval or pear-shaped. 4 to 15 millimetres long and coloured yellow, red, pink, white or black. Despite variation, mistletoes are easy to recognise. Their foliage usually contrasts with the host and the point of attachment is obvious. Leaves are rather thick and the fruit pulp is sticky with one seed. Mistletoes grow in all habitats from mangroves and jungles to deserts on a spectrum of shrubs and trees. Some parasitize, parasitize each other. Uses. Mistletoe could not get by without the mistletoe bird, which eats their fruits and voids the sticky seeds on live twigs where the plants must grow. The bird's stomach is a special tube for processing mistletoe fruits, which pass through in 25 minutes. Aborigines ate the fruits of many kinds of mistletoes, especially Amy Yemma species, and some desert species were highly prized, though not all were used. The pulp of most kinds tastes pleasantly sweet, though the stickiness is annoying. On Stradbroke Island near Brisbane, the Aborigines made chewing gum by chewing the half-ripe fruits. There you go. Now you know. Mistletoe grows all over Australia. Unlike something like Devil's Twines, or pink-flowered native raspberry, or currant bush. So there you go, Ed. Get into what the biologists have to say about Australia's native food plants and try not to pay too much attention to the point of view of the people who think that the purpose of Australia is to grow grass which can be fed to livestock so it can be sent to the market. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.